Good day, everyone. Thank you. My name is Meredith Leon McCormick for World Bride Magazine, and welcome to our summer series. Our summer series is, is created so that we can highlight some of our favorite designers and experts in the bridal and the fashion industry. I have the honor, the pleasure of interviewing one of the most respected fashion designers in the world, Mr. Naeem Khan. Hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> it's so fun to be with you guys. It's, I'm so happy that on times like this, here we are sitting and having this wonderful conversation. And it's, so happy you know, you're, you're, you're so respected in the industry. And I know that, you know, you're a humble man because I've met you and I've, I've seen you backstage during New York Fashion Week. And the crowds just go crazy for you. Crazy for you. So let's, I let's, wanted... <laughs> By the way, let's not talk about crowds anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm so sad about that. No, it's like the world is so different. I miss all that. I, I know. Miss the, drama. the human miss contact all. and all that great stuff. Yeah, but you know what? We are going to come back stronger, better, much more leaner. With, with You know, we have to keep the fight on. And you have to. We'll be amazing. You wait and see. Absolutely. It's all I agree. So for the people that have been living under a rock and don't know who you are, can you briefly tell us what brought you into the fashion industry and New York City? Oh, my goodness. So my story goes like this. I was born in a family that makes textiles for now for about 100 years. I'm the third generation son Grand, my grandfather used to make luxurious textiles in India for the royal family, for high class social, I mean like socialites. And you know, the rich, rich, rich. Fabrics made by hand, gold, pearl, silver, all that kind of stuff. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a family, of course seeing all those textiles being made. I came here to go to school when I was 19, but as my luck would have it, have it, I went for a meeting with my dad. Who tag, I tagged along with my dad for a meeting at Halston, who was the designer of, of America at that time. And sitting with him, and I'm very chirpy, and I know my father's business, so I was explaining him what we do. He said, my God, you know so much. You don't need to go to school. Come work for me. Wow. You have to work. Wow. So at 19, I became Halston's assistant, and that's how my career started. And that's how I moved to New York in 1978. So I've been living here since then. You know, but you know, it's like I do believe in a force. I believe in faith. I believe in, you know, what's meant to happen happens. A certain amount of luck. But you need to take that luck and you need to drive it. You need to make a dream come through through that luck. And that's exactly what You did. You, you managed to take a family legacy Cut, take the chance, come and live in New York, work with what was then the most respected designer, Halston, who did one, who did the Battle of Versailles, I have to say, which changed the whole world about the perspective of American fashion designers. And then now you are successfully running the most glamorous, well-respected brands in the world that that has in, that that seems to me has been infused by your culture so can you tell us a little bit about this and why was that so important to you to keep your culture connected to your new career so i must tell you that after halston it was not always uh, you know, a, like a rocket thing that I became successful overnight. It has been many, many years of, of, you know, ups and downs of life and business to get to this point. But heritage and culture means a lot to me. The reason why, when I was growing up, my grandfather, in the embroidery business, you have millions of workers who are artists, who are craftsmen, who have been doing the same uh, beautiful handmade things from one generation to another. And they were part of my family business. There were 2,000 of them at that time. And wow. so, and you know, when you grew up with a, a grandfather who was the chairman of the union for the embroiders for entire India, and he took care of his workers, like taking wow. care of if they, were, if they needed proper light, if they had ventilation in their factories, if they were being paid well, if they were drinking their water, because... In those days, people sitting and embroidering, they used to die of kidney diseases because wow. they never... So my grandfather was very instrumental 
in like making sure that they got their health and health taken care of and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, when you come from a family such, it just becomes part of you to make sure that you're taking care of the people around, you, number one. Number two, coming from India, which has such a great, great history of, you know, the Maharajas to luxury to even even when you're poor. I mean, like, you know, you, you might be working in a field, but you learn to live life in a happy way. It means you would be wearing color. You would be still having some gold on you. You know, so within the poverty, there is people learn to live within it and find happiness. Secondly, when you look at the Maharajas, you look at all those amazing palaces and you think Versailles is one. In India, you have a thousand of those. Right. So growing up with a family that was so much love in the family, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, we were like, you know, you, so, you know, you grow up with a very good, solid core of happiness, plus with the vision on the colors of India. To me, that makes me feel like, you know, culture and, and love and happiness and humanity has to be taken all into account when you are designing or when you're when you're, you know, when you live with everything. So that's I And think. it's translated, but it's translated in all the work that you do because you are one of the very few that has consistently, not seasonally, not because the media, uh, you know, shames people, have included every woman of every cultural background within your runways and your advertisement and your presentation. How important was that for you? You know, it, 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 it means everything to me because I grew up with a bit of a bias. I grew up seeing what happened to me. So, you know, when things have happened to you and success has not been so easy, I have fought my way. I have, I have you know, figured things out smartly to make myself who I am. And I'm not saying that I'm some big, rich designer. I still work hard, but I just feel that what has gone through with me, I feel that I need to include. I feel that, you know, look what happened to me, that I need to include everybody. And it's wow. a very big part of my life that I need to have, you know, all the people that, who don't get that opportunity. It's brilliant. And it, and it can be felt. And I had the pleasure of meeting your son, and he carries the same sentiment about oh, the collection and the brand. The yeah. one that's running it. <laughs> so I do. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you that for me, the biggest thing that showed me how humble you were and how appreciative you were was when you had the honor of dressing Michelle Obama oh and my. you still humbly said, I wasn't even sure. Yes, I sent for options, but I wasn't sure if she wasn't, was going to wear one. Tell us, how did that make you feel dressing the first lady? Oh my God. You know, when I, when, when I was first told that I needed to design this and she's asking something from me and, uh, and I was so uncertain, so nervous, but I really did not want to miss that opportunity because this would, I know how much it would mean to me. And this was my dream since I was 14 years old to wow. dress the first year of the United States. And I have, my, my friends who are from school have told me this, that remember those conversations you said? And wow. look, your dream came true. So then when I got the opportunity to do this, I didn't want to take any chances. So I obviously designed four pieces, but every piece was thought through. There was a number one piece that I really wanted her to wear, which she did. And so the idea of that dress was America and me. Where wow. Do I, what's my culture? Who educated me? What did my family give me? So I took a very simple shape of a strapless dress, which is so Halston. I took a pattern that was to embroider on it, which is inspired from Andy Warhol, which was kind wow. of poppy, but I manipulated the poppies in the way I wanted them. Then I took a technique that I learned from my grandfather of sewing these sterling silver sequin, um, but in metal, in, in a very flat way on one sequin at a time. And I created this texture on a, on a you know, like a, like a Yiddish fabric tool and on a corset that had many different ways of stretching and tightening. So you could wow. hook it up 
or you could, you know, like, so there was, there is no way she's going to escape me, right? Because you put it on, it's going to look amazing. And it was fantastic. Fent- I mean, breathtaking. It became, breathtaking. it, you became the number three most Googled person after that dress. And you so humbly admitted because of her wearing that dress, your career started to skyrocket and the interest started coming in where other people hesitate dressing black women. You do not shy away from the challenges of designing something for shapelier, curvier women and women of color, you know? And I think this is why everybody continues to remain loyal to you as a brand and now you admit because you've had to deal with the challenges yourself so of course you know how to relate the message back to others you know and be compassionate you know for it so for that i want to tell you thank you so much for being humble enough to admit it you know i i love you for that <laughs> but you understand that i see beauty because where i come from i grew up in india where we did not we do not see color the way you would see color in america so to me Everybody is the same. To me, I see beauty in what, whoever it is. Either you could be from Asia or here or wherever. And right. you find the best and you, you, you make it happen. You know, everybody's beautiful. I mean, like, I don't understand the idea of determining color as being a factor of not liking somebody, which doesn't even go to my head, you know, so... I- this is the world we live in, unfortunately. Tell us, there's your your bridal gowns are exquisite. And for me, it's a continuation of what you've done in, in, in evening wear and ready to wear. What can you tell our brides to inspire them with your collection? What inspires you when you're designing your bridal collection? So firstly, understand that my dresses have a lot of human touch energy to it, right? So because I have some of the most amazing craftsmen who put their artisanal touch into my clothes. So when somebody makes these clothes with that energy, there is is power in those clothes. And I honestly believe that. So that's number one. Number two, my collection is based on classics. It's not trendy. I don't believe in trends. So when you get a dress from me, you can take it out 20 years down the line and you can give it to your daughter or your family and it'll still be beautiful. The textiles, everything from the materials I use is all chosen by me. I sit there, I draw it, I make it, I choose everything that goes into each and every dress. It's not like I'm a company and some other people are making the decision. So you're buying a dress from me, it's my my life is into that dress. Wow. So it's all about, you know, what you put into something that reflects on you. And to me, that is the most important thing because what I do is to make you look as beautiful as, as ever. That's And you job. do. And you said that it was Mark Ingram, a dear friend of ours, that <laughs> helped you through the process. Can you give us a brief description of that relationship? So talking about the kindest, sweetest man, and I was not aware when I first, I mean, my ready-to-wear business, as you know, was, is, is, is around the world. Uh, and when I got into the bridal business, it was definitely a very easy you know, transition for me because of all the techniques I have used in the past. So, but the cut when you design bridal is very different. Now you're designing for a, a 23-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 28-year-old who's young and her body is, you know, much more different than, than my ready to wear. So when I launched my first collection and I made the production, not the production, the first lot that went out was based on the ready to wear. And I had no idea that it needs to be cut differently. Well, all I can tell you is Mark Ingram, the kindest, sweetest man was at my rescue. He wow. came up to my office, we sat down, he was there to guide me, to tell me, I mean, this is the way it should be, this is how you need to do it. And like, just to help me, through to get it through i took all those that merchandise back recut it remade it and shipped it again so basically i owe a lot to mark ingram to really really defining my collection and helping me become a bridal designer he's a he's a he's an amazing man a kind man he didn't have to do it he didn't know me but you know he loved he loves art he loves beauty and he saw that there was a potential here 
and he felt that he needs to, you know, help. And so, I, I'm so proud to be to know him, to work with him. And now Mark and I serve um, on the bridal council that you're also a part of. Um, so we know you. We He speaks so highly of you. Your work has been proven over and over and over again. So which leads me to a little bit of uncomfortable topic. And I was hurt that you had to say it, had to say it. But it is a problem that we have had to face. On page six, um, with this whole CFDA, Tom Ford issue, and your question was, do I need to be white? You know, and it is a common problem. And people seem to think that because you are successful, that it came easy. Because you didn't complain, because you focused on where you wanted to be, that there wasn't a problem. Can you elaborate briefly on that and why you felt it, it was necessary to go public with that? First of all, I'm not shy. I'm not a shy person. And <laughs> I, feel I have built my brand and my life by myself. Of course, the help of other people who are kind and nice. So, and which I'm very grateful to. But as far as this situation is concerned, if you go back and look through the history of getting these awards, how many people of color have got this award? How many same people have got this award? It's always the same group of people being nominated. If within, if you are the the committee that is going to help America take forward and inspire other designers and hold their hands. You need to give them a little pat on their back. You cannot just be patting yourself because you are part of that group and just keep you know, building your businesses. I mean, just simply, Tom Ford is the chairman of the council. Why do you as a chairman get nominated? I understand you're a designer. You know, if I were him, I would, I would say, I don't think I need to be nominated that would be more honorable and respectful rather than sitting there and gloating and be part of that. I just feel that there's, there's not much inclusion when it comes to recognizing art. Like you look at, I'm not saying that I was doing this because I wanted to get an award. I'm saying is look at Karina Herrera, look at Oscar Arenta, look at some other designers who are so fantastic, but they are, they are people of minority, they're people from islands or they're colored. They're not recognized or they might be recognized, but it's like speckled here and there. I think, I'm sorry that I spoke up, but somebody needs to. We just can't just keep on living this, keep it quiet. And by the way, it doesn't affect me. I have built my world on my own and I don't need anybody to make <laughs> Yes, yes, Mr. Khan. Respect, respect, respect. Well, I will tell you how that made me feel because we have now created the multicultural committee where our goal is to move the fashion world forward from the fashion person, the bridal perspective, and you are part of that. And it was important to me to have you on and to highlight you as one of the respected and celebrated designer because so many minorities or brown people from all over the world or that might not be recognized as brown people because they happen to have lighter skin that are they feel rejected but they're not as bold and courageous to say something about it so when you said it it just fueled me and said okay i will honor this gentleman that was bold enough to say something about it but it's not going to benefit you because you're fine. You can ignore it. You have an empire. But when you speak up and people like you speak up, it opens doors for the next two, three, four generations. And if it continues to be ignored, nothing will ever change. Works. And I, I mean, thank you for that. Thank you. I mean, I mean, you look, you look at the history of our country, what we ignored and where it has led to that today our eyes are opening and today we are we are looking to make the change. And by the way, I have something so fantastic in work, you will see, which I can't even tell you right now what it is, but I'm tying up with somebody so amazing and going to change the world of fashion because of this issue. 
and it's going to be very, very big. Something well, big. Well, I is- know it is. I know it is because you don't do anything less. So the <laughs> final thing that I want to talk about with our readers, viewers, is you care so much about our environment. You started to create masks. Why did you do that? And give us a little information about you, the mass that you're creating. Well, I was the first one. I mean, this was actually in early, early June when you looked at what was going on in New York. It was like the world was coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And you saw everything was that, of course, how do we protect ourselves? There were, and the mass we started creating was not for just giving to people. It was sending to the hospitals. We created 5,000 masks masks in like two weeks. And wow. it was basically, you know, getting my team together and saying, guys, let's go to the office, protect ourselves, go to the office, look at the textiles, which can be made, the, what can we make the masks from? We found bolts of fabrics, we made the masks, called the hospitals, and my girls were amazing. They took all the stuff home. We had to send machines here and there, and boom, wow. the mask production. So you know what? When things like that happen, you have to take charge. And basically, I took charge. We said, like, got to do something. We cannot be lying at home watching TV. What the hell? The world's coming to an end. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for that. That... No, it changed the world and it made us see the seriousness. But it also showed the social responsibility that the fashion industry took and you leading the way, paving the way and seeing the bigger picture. So for that is why I thank you for taking those measures and steps that needed to be taken. Thank you so much. Now I've I've become an expert at masks. (laughs) (laughs) So please, can you tell us, I want to thank you first of all, but please tell us where can our readers and viewers find you? Give us all your social media, your name and all of that good stuff. So the best place to look for bridal for me is Naeem Khan, bride, that's N-A-E-E-M-K-H-A-N-B-R-I-D-E. Mm-hmm. That's the Instagram handle. And my ready to wear is Naeem Khan NYC on the Instagram as well. Perfect. Those are the two main places you can find us. And also we have our website, uh, which is naeemkhan.com, on which you have your bridal dresses and you're ready to wear. Um, It's all there. But I do want to tell you that we have also done something where when the brides ran into problems with not getting the dresses, so we opened up a small division where if you ever need anything, couture or you're in trouble, you can call us and we will make sure that you get a bridal dress from Naeem Khan. What? That's amazing. You know, to me, like you have no idea how many distress calls we receive because the stores are closed, they're getting married, and they don't have a dress. And we got the dress done in 10 days. What? Like, yeah. I mean, That's it's amazing. incredible. That's amazing. So, That's amazing. So you have to come through. And this taught us so, this, this closure has taught us so much where we can be nimble, we can be social, we can stand up for ourselves. You know, all that stuff. And today, I think as we go forward, we are going to be better humans, caring about the world and humanity, and run our businesses as tight as we can, and hopefully make big profits. Wow. Thank you so much for your time. I am honored. I'm over the moon. And and I'm telling you, my fans, my our supporters love you as much as we love you. We love you. They love you so much. The you, industry loves you. Thank you. And I'm honored to be a, be a part of the bridal council with you guys. Yes. So yes. Thank you. So guys, I want to tell you, please support Mr. Naeem Khan, his work that he has continued to do. From a young child, which he probably got through osmosis from his great his grandfather, his dad. It's about family legacy. So until the next time, please continue to show each other love and support and keep the industry fresh and good to one another. Ciao, Bella.